What's up, Packer fans? Welcome into the Packaday Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Here today to recap day six of Packers training camp, and we finally had pads, just shoulder pads, but it was still great to see the pads on. Things were popping a little bit more. You could hear the, the players colliding together a bit more, all in a good way. Nothing like what happened at Panthers practice on Tuesday, but uh, it was great to see the players out in pads. And this is really when the heart of practices really begin. And yes, it was great to see the Packers out at training camp prior to this, and you could still get some takeaways. But until the pads come on, you have to kind of reserve judgment a little bit. And now we're going to get into the thick of things as things heat up here for the remainder of training camp. But um, let's get to some news and notes first before we jump into some of the big plays and takeaways from day six of training camp. Let's start with a surprise move. I didn't expect to be talking about Bailey Gaither at the top of the episode today. Uh, How However, he surprisingly retired. And as you heard me the last couple days, Gaither's been a player who has been impressive in camp, in in rookie minicamps and OTAs. Now, physically, Gaither is limited. Uh, This is definitely more of a player that's going to have to, you know, win with technique and things like that. But he was consistently getting separation against cornerbacks and he was running good routes. He made a good contested catch up in the air the other day and we almost got flipped on his head. Uh, He's just been good. Like there's no other way around it. And he retired uh, unexpectedly. So hopefully everything's good with Bailey. And, uh, you know, he made a choice that's the best for him, which is, you know, like hopefully that's the case. And um, he's happy with that decision. Um, But disappointing to see that, uh, again, a player that I thought had a really good chance at making a practice squad. And maybe that was always his ceiling, who knows, but um, is no longer with the team. Um, In his stead, uh, Green Bay did pick up a tight end on Tuesday. They signed Daniel Crawford, the tight end. Um, So he will take Bailey Gaither's place, was also wearing number 80. Uh, So it didn't take long to to repurpose that number. Um, And Green Bay could use some depth at tight end right now, frankly, uh, with, you know, Josiah DeGuara and Dominique Daphne both hurt. You know, Mercedes Lewis is going to get his rest days here and there. So uh, you don't want to work, you know, Tunyon too much. You've got Sternberg, You've got Isaac Nada. You've got Bronson Kafusi, who's a, uh, you know, turned defensive lineman into tight end. So not a ton of depth there, especially with the injuries right now. So makes sense to maybe add somebody into that mix in Daniel Crawford, and we'll see what he has moving forward. Uh, one other bit of news, uh, more from an injury standpoint, sounds like the injury that Randy, uh, Randy Ramsey suffered on Monday is going to keep him out for a significant period of time. Uh, Matt LaFleur definitely bummed about the injury. And yeah, you know, you might be thinking, well, Randy Ramsey, you know, whatever, no big deal. Uh, Ramsey was a pretty core special teams player for this team and somebody that, um, you know, frankly, I thought was actually one of the better special teams players. You you hear sometimes core special teams player, like Oren Burks is a, a fair example of this, not to throw Oren under the, the bus here. Uh, but, uh, you know, Oren Burks was a core special teams player, but there were a lot of mistakes that Oren made out in the field. Now, Ramsey, when he was out there, generally, from what I saw, and I'll be totally transparent, I'm not breaking down a ton of special teams tape, but from what I saw, Ramsey was usually pretty good out there on team. So that's somebody that they're going to have to play, replace in that regards. And while they have, I, I think, a very you know, likely number four edge rusher on the team already in Jonathan Garvin. Uh, Garvin, not as adept at playing special teams. So uh, definitely a hole there. Maybe Tipa Nalii, you know, gets more in the conversation and could be that player who also shines on special teams. He has that sort of ability, uh, but that's going to be something that needs to be worked out. And again, well, you know, you're probably not losing too much sleep over Ramsey, you know, being hurt. It's still disappointing and certainly was a player that had a role on this team. So he will be out, it seems, for an extended period. And again, we'll see who steps up uh, with, him, with him currently being out. Uh, let's get to our plays of the day first. So two big plays. Uh, the first one happened around mid-practice and Aaron Rodgers was reading the play going to Devontae Adams. It was man coverage on the play, or at least it looked like it. And he's got a deep crosser and Adams is coming open. Unbeknownst to him, Jair Alexander, who's you know running a you know I think a sideline route on the other side, comes off of his man, reads the play underneath to Devontae Adams, made a perfect read, made a great uh, you know leaping interception, I guess if you will. It landed right in the waiting hands of Jair Alexander, and he took it the other way. And, and honestly, I don't know if it would have been a pick six or how far he would have made it. I kind of stopped watching and, and started tweeting about uh, the big play by Jair Alexander, if I'm being honest. Uh, but it was still a huge play by Jair. And those are the, like, you talk about Jair being great. He's there, right? There's no question about that. Jair Alexander is great, great. If you wanted to start talking about Hall of Fame slash legendary, which is within Jair Alexander's purview, if he has the longevity and if he continues to improve, he's not obviously there yet. 
but now it's the big plays. Now it's the interceptions. Now it's the game-changing moments. Charles Woodson, phenomenal at those, right? That's a Hall of Fame player because he constantly changed the game. Now, you don't necessarily have to do that. In Like Darrell Revis is a great example. Revis didn't have, like, I'll, I have to check this. I don't know Revis's stats off the top of my head, but recollection is Revis was always a great shutdown guy, didn't always get a ton of interceptions because nobody ever threw his way. Arguably still a Hall of Famer. Um, so you can be just a shutdown corner and still get there. But if you can make some plays, a la Deion Sanders, Charles Woodson, etc., now you're in a totally different stratosphere of player. So you love seeing that from Jair Alexander. And then, of course, the other shutdown player who came up with a big six, uh, pick six uh, on Tuesday practice was none other than TJ Slayton. Because, of course, um, two-minute drill uh, for the second team to end practice. Um, Jordan Love and the offense has, have the ball. I believe it may have been Wellington Prevalon who got his hands up and, and tipped the ball, but don't quote me on that. Um, but anyway, love through, ball tipped, and Slayton did a nice job of corralling the ball and then literally turning into the biggest running back you've ever seen, a la BJ Raji, and dude was booking it the other way and had a pick six into the end zone. So for a you know a training camp so far, where the defense hasn't come up with any, you know, a ton of big plays. Ty Summers had an interception. I think that was really the only turnover up until this point, um, you know, prior to this practice. Uh, two big picks. Jair Alexander had one against Rodgers. TJ Slayton with a pick six in two-minute drill uh, with the offense down seven at the end of the game. So uh, nice job. I thought the defense had its moments today, finally. Um, offense still killed them on checkdowns. But again, those big plays will certainly uh, generate some buzz. And again, just seeing TJ Slayton pick off a pass and run the other way was worth the price of admission, which was frankly free, but still worth the price of admission nonetheless. Player of the day, Juwan freaking Winfrey. I mean, my goodness. And I, as I told you guys recently, like I've been hesitant to jump on the Juwan Winfrey bandwagon and, and to, you know, go too out of control with the hype or things like that. He is coming up with play after play after play. Uh, one-on-ones, I was talking to Nagler about this on the sideline, like one-on-one -on -one when you've got corner versus wide receiver, it's not real football. You've got no help. You don't have, always have like the leverage that you can use. It's almost like a Madden mini game more than it is like a real true football. And you don't know what these guys are working on. However, you still get to see kind of some of their releases off the line of scrimmage. You get to see the separation. And more importantly, the wide receiver in the corner take these very seriously and they want to win their rep. And Jawan Winfrey got matched up with Eric Stokes on three different occasions and smoked Stokes all three times. In team drills, he came up with a couple catches outside of the one I'm about to talk about. But then the big one, two minute drill, Winfrey gets a shot with the ones, finds uh, you know a space in between cover two, the John Gruden turkey hole, if you will, finds space, gets a, you know, Rogers throws him a great pass, gets his feet down, gets out of bounds, and another big completion for Jawan Winfrey, just showing up play after play after play. He is human, we found out. Uh, in the developmental period, Jordan Love threw him a pass on the sideline that he couldn't come down with. Um, he may have been out of bounds or at least, you know, trying to get his footwork in, which could have caused some some issues, but um, he, he did have one drop. But man, he was great. And there was one one-on-one -on -one with Stokes where he stole Eric Stokes' soul, like literally took his lunch money, made fun of him, like made the rest of the class laugh. And like he, he, he literally just completely took him out. And uh, unfortunately on the play, it was a bad throw and he had to kind of reach back one handed and couldn't corral the pass. But uh, there was one specific play where again, in one-on-ones where uh, Winfrey just absolutely obliterated Stokes. Now on the flip side, Eric Stokes, tough day. You know, lost all three one on ones to Juwan Winfrey. Had a couple plays where he got beat, you know, down the sideline. Alan Lazard beat him on a quick cross or a quick in breaking slant. Um, Lazard was able to get it easily. No, no contests from, from Stokes whatsoever. So, a lot of talent with Eric Stokes still putting it together. We have yet to see Stokes really make any sort of play on the ball. Um, he's getting beat by some of the better wide receivers, which is understandable at this point in his career. Uh, but, you know, ideally when you have a first round pick, you want to see them come in and make some plays and establish themselves. It, it, I'm not talking about consistently, right? I'm not expecting Eric Stokes to come in and just be great at corner day one, but you want to start seeing some plays, some confidence, things like that. And frankly, we haven't seen that. And even Jawan Winfrey, who again, by all accounts is having a great camp, um, you would like to see him hold up against those battles and he hasn't been able to. So still a steep learning curve for Eric Stokes. On the flip side, another rookie cornerback, uh, Shamar Jean Charles, I thought had a pretty nice practice. Uh, he had a couple of pass breakups um, and just was, you know, solid in coverage. He had one play. 
I guess one pass breakup and then another play had really sticky coverage on Amari Rogers, uh, where Rogers was, you know, just basically trying to get into his route, kind of juke him out. And Shamar just stuck with him and didn't give him any space whatsoever. So uh, Shamar working in the slot looks very natural in that position. Um, and we'll see, you know, if that develops in anything as has been noted. Um, Chandon Sullivan has been the guy in the slot this, this camp. So all the, you know, questions of who's going to play the star and who's going to be, um, you know, and all the potential competition there. It is for sure Shannon Sullivan up until this point. We'll see what happens when Kevin King gets back, if maybe they try to shuffle and rotate some things some more. But as of right now, definitely looks like Shannon Sullivan's that guy, but some nice plays today from Shamar Jean Charles. Devontae Adams had a slightly off day. He did everything right, line of scrimmage, route running, everything, but had two deep passes that he had in his hands and both just bounced right off his hands. It may have even been three. It was two or three, um, but just uncharacteristic drops from Devontae Adams. He had one the other day too. So uh, Tom Silverstein noted, I think it was Silverstein noted, I think in a tweet that uh, this tends to happen with Devontae early where he struggles with concentration and drops a little bit during camp and then it never really comes up again. So hopefully this is Devontae just kind of getting it out of his system. And there is, let me just say, there's zero concern with Devontae Adams. He had two drops whatever, but a weird semi-off day for Adams. Robert Tunyon is playing with a ton of confidence right now. I didn't get a chance to to talk about this much yesterday uh, or the day before, whatever it was. But I mean, man, when you have a good season and you gain the confidence, he has all the confidence in the world right now. He's catching everything that's coming his way. And, uh, you know, there was a route again against Eric Stokes where just a quick out in two minute drill, just great, perfectly run route caught right in the hands, two feet down, out of bounds, and just simple stuff. And he just looks like he's playing with so much more confidence this year after a really impressive 2020 season. A couple last notes. Henry Black continues to be the safety in dime ahead of Vernon Scott. Remember, Will Redmond is still out, so we'll see if Redmond comes back. But as of right now, uh, Henry Black has been the player that has been the basically the nickel, or excuse me, the dime defensive back with Adrian Amos going down in the box. And then last but not least, KB Nento got a, a couple reps with the ones um, at the end of, of, or really during the two minute drill, I guess I should say. And it was a crossing route. And it was, you know, one where, you know, he kind of passes it off to begin with because there's a linebacker chilling there and realized he didn't have anyone to cover. So he booked it to the middle of the field because he realized that the crosser was going to, you know, get obviously past that, that, you know, that linebacker eventually booked it diving pass breakup and, and a really nice play by KB Nento as well. And you know, if KB Nento makes a play, I'm always going to mention it. So uh, Shannon Sullivan made a really nice play too on a screen to AJ Dillon, uh, read it perfectly. It would have been a big play, but read it perfectly, shed his block and got right on Dillon immediately. Now uh, that one-on-one battle, AJ Dillon maybe would have had something to say in uh, in actuality if they were, if it was live and you know he could have run through maybe Shannon Sullivan a little bit, but no question about it. Really nice play from Shannon Sullivan. That's going to do it for me today with my news and notes from day six of Packers training camp. No practice, no open practice on Wednesday. I will be out there on Thursday again. So we'll recap that practice. But of course, I'll be right back here tomorrow with an all new episode. So make sure to check that out. And the easiest way to do that is by subscribing. So if you haven't yet, make sure to do so. I'll see you guys tomorrow. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.